It was actually the Greek philosopher Democritus that originally coined the term atom, meaning indivisible. But it wasn't until 22 centuries later when John Dalton laid out a series of postulates that formalized this idea and really forever changed the way we thought about the modern world. This was going to be the first of two significant scientific revolutions um, that, that we'll be touching on. Dalton said specifically four things. He said that all matter was indeed composed of indivisible atoms, that the element, or that elements rather, were a type of matter composed of only one type of atom, that a compound, on the other hand, was something composed of two or more types of atoms, and finally that chemical reactions involved the rearrangement of these atoms, uh, of the atoms of the reactants to give products. So again, the notion that although there are millions and millions of chemical substances known, that they all could be described by various combinations of a small collection of different types of atoms. Now, this actually is, is tremendously important because although these ideas turn out not to be 100% correct, in, in particular, as we'll learn in just a moment, that atoms, in fact, are uh, divisible, and in fact, those particles even can be divisible. No one knows where the end of this is going to be, in fact. And also that an element, that an atom of a particular element comes in only one characteristic, characteristic mass, that also we'll see in a moment, turns out not to be completely true. But nonetheless, this basic idea that substances were just combinations of different atoms, and in particular, a very small set of different kinds of atoms, was fundamentally important and changing the way that we approached scientific problems and how we thought of our world. So what I want to do now is look at those first experiments that started to probe the, the details of what the particles are that made up the atom. Now, first of all, what are we going to deal with? Let's just cut to the chase, and I'm going to tell you, uh, in an atom, in a neutral atom, which is, again, overall neutral, we have three types of particles. We have the electron. The electron has a fundamental unit of charge, which is going to be the opposite of a proton, which we'll get to in a moment. And it has a very, very light mass compared to a proton, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Much, much lighter, about almost 2,000 times lighter than a proton, which is going to have a complementary charge to the electron, exactly the same but opposite, and a mass, again, considerably larger, actually closer to 1,800 times larger than the mass of an electron. And then there is the neutron. A neutron has a mass very similar to a proton. You'll notice it's just a tiny bit bigger, but it has no charge to it, as the name would imply. Okay? Now, how did these numbers come into being? Where did we actually get these numbers from? What were the experiments that gave rise to this information? Let's focus first on the electron and how we ultimately found out what its mass and what its charge actually was. Now, for a number of years before Thompson, J.J. Thompson here, there were people playing with electron uh, not with electron, with, with charged particle beams that people had a lot of fun taking tubes, putting an incredibly high voltage across the tube and generating a beam of charged particles and then watching that beam bend in magnetic fields or electronic fields. Well, it was eventually realized that the beam that, that was being generated by doing this very often was just an electron beam. Electrons, again, are the things that would be that, that would accumulate to build up charge on something, for instance. And so one could generate a beam of these electrons and, uh, and have it very narrowly defined. And Thompson took just a, a glorified version of what was originally called a Crookes tube, which I'll show you here, to try to figure out what the mass and charge of the electron was. Now let me describe very specifically what this experiment is. Again, we start out with a pair of plates that we apply a voltage across, very high voltage, such that electrons actually start to travel across the plate. They leave the cathode, they accelerate through this potential difference, and most of them just collide on the anode. 
but a few of them managed to make, through, make it through a small pinhole in the middle of the anode, and so they continued to travel then. What we've done at this stage is simply form a uniform beam of electrons. And in fact, the speed of those electrons could be adjusted by varying the potential across that pair of accelerator plates. Okay, so that's the first step. Now, we've got our beam generated. Now we want to probe what's going to happen, or we want to probe this beam of particles, of electrons. So there are two things that, that Thompson did. He exposed those electrons to another electric field now. This is not an accelerating, well, it is. It's, it, uh, um, let me just back up a step. We move that pair, or, or that beam of electrons through a pair of plates that we apply another potential um, across, and this causes that beam to deflect. If, for instance, we apply a potential such that we have a buildup of positive charge on the bottom plate and negative charge on the top plate, then this beam of electrons is found to deflect towards the positive plate, indicating again that the charge of this beam would be negative in this case, qualitatively. Now, um, there also is a magnetic field that is applied, and a charged beam of particles, when it passes through a magnetic field, as long as it's traveling with velocity, is deflected from that magnetic field as well. And so what Thompson did was he took the beam, he first of all applied an electric field to deflect that beam, and then he applied a magnetic field that caused the beam to deflect in the opposite direction. And in fact, then he adjusted those two fields, the magnetic field and electronic field, until they exactly canceled each other out so that the beam traveled straight through. Then by going through some physics calculations, and you have to take a different Think Well course to do the physics, he could determine what the speed of that electron beam was. So he knew the speed of the electrons. By knowing the speed of the electrons, he ultimately could determine the ratio of the charge of the electrons to the mass of the electrons. But he couldn't determine the charge or the mass, only the ratio of charge to mass. In other words, think about two different particles that you want to look at, and you look at how fast they accelerate by putting them in an electric field, you can't tell the difference between if a let's say the slower moving particle, is it moving slower because it's more massive or is it moving slower because it doesn't have as high of a charge? He could not differentiate between those two factors. And so as a result, the charge to mass ratio that he determined um, or rather, all he could determine was the charge to mass ratio, and it has a value of 1.75 times 10 to the minus 11th coulombs, that's the unit of charge, per kilogram. Okay, so again, what he really wants out of this is charge and mass, not that ratio, but this was an important first step to getting it. Now, before we go on, let me just show you specifically what he did, um, try to show you a demonstration here. This is uh, a device called an oscilloscope. It consists indeed of an electron beam traveling towards you, and the beam then hits a fluorescent, a phosphorescent screen, rather, and so... Uh, what happens in this case is where the electron beam strikes the screen, uh, light is emitted, and so you can see where the electron beam is ending. And in fact, the electronics in this device are scanning that beam so you see a line rather than a dot. That's purely to, to make it a little bit easier for you to see. But so we have an electron beam traveling directly towards you, and now if I move this knob, if I do this adjustment, I can push that beam up, or I can push that beam down, and all I'm doing inside this box here is changing the potential, the voltage, across these plates, these electric plates. So that again is causing the beam to move up or down. Now, so I could take that beam and I could move it down, let's say, then I can take my magnetic field, in this case I just have a strong magnet, and bring it in and try to adjust that beam back up again. Now, I'm not going to be able to do that exactly, but let's see if I can move this guy back up here. So you can see what happens when I bring the magnetic field in. I can push that beam down. I can turn the magnet around and push the beam the other direction. You don't want to do this to your television or you'll really wreck it. By the way, this is exactly how a television works. It's just an electron beam with a screen. The exact same idea in the electronics. Scan the electron all over the place 
the electron beam all over the place to, to create a picture for you. But anyway, again, the idea of the Thompson experiment was to use a magnetic field to deflect the beam, to use an electric field to compensate for that deflection, and then do a little bit of calculating to figure out the speed of the electron beam, and from there you can determine the charge to mass ratio. But remember, the most important point, we couldn't determine the charge or mass alone. It wasn't until the milk and oil drop experiment where we're going to be able to determine that, and once we find out one of these guys, we're going to know the other. So that's coming up next.